welcome to everyone who's here and uh, the, our panelists. We're really excited uh, to have you here. Um, my, my name is Scott Bernstein. I'm the Director of Policy at the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, which is which is a, a national organization in Canada made up of 55 organizations advocating for drug policy reform that promotes public health, human rights, and social inclusion. Um, I just have a, a few housekeeping details. So the first one is this webinar is being recorded. And so we're going to finish in 90 minutes at uh, 1600, uh, sorry, uh, 1800 uh, UK time. Um, and uh, you can engage in the discussion using the chat box um, uh, in Zoom that's on the bottom of uh, the, the, your uh, window you're looking at. Um, and you can, uh, uh, for those who have just joined, please introduce yourself in, in the chat box with your name and your organization. If you have, actually want to ask a question to the panelist, um, you, you can do that in the Q&A. And so that's the other function down at the bottom of the chat window. Um, if you're, if you're a Twitter, you can use the hashtag a world with drugs. And uh, please, please feel free to engage. Uh, that makes these webinars even more interesting uh, when you're able to engage through chat and Q&A. So uh, I invite you to do that. Um, and so make sure, make sure when you are chatting, though, that you send your message to panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it'll just be the panelists who can see that, though. Um, we'll also be posting, if you look in the chat, we're going to be posting some relevant links there. Uh, and uh, you can keep an eye out uh, for those as you go. So uh, most of them are in context with what people, context of what people are saying. So um, I'd like to first uh, acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, that is unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish First Peoples, and uh, we live on uh, the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh here. And um, I just want to acknowledge that particularly because uh, in, in our field of drug policy, um, it, it's often uh, indigenous people who had been the subject of disproportional criminalization and laws uh, around uh, target, targeting their use of uh, drugs. Um, this is a series, a webinar series hosted by Health Poverty Action, and it's in collaboration with uh, six, under, six other organizations. Those are the International Drug Policy Consortium, IDPC, Transform Drug Policy Foundation, Transnational Institute, Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, Instituto RIA, Interdisciplinary Center for Cannabis Research, and the Regulation Project. I want to let you know that Transform just launched a much anticipated book called How to Regulate Stimulants, a practical guide uh, that is free to download and, and we're posting the link to that. And also recently IDPC released a brief called Principles for Responsible Legal Regulation of Cannabis that overlaps with uh, many of the issues that we talk about in these uh, webinar series. Um, we have four panelists today who will present for eight minutes each. And then we have time for Q&A uh, for about 30 minutes. And I, I just want to say this webinar is fourth in a series of eight groundbreaking discussions exploring the intersection of legal regulation of drugs and development. We're examining how legally regulated drug markets can work for people and the planet while avoiding exploitation and inequity fueled by years of prohibition policies. Previous webinars have addressed drugs as a development issue, cultural, traditional, indigenous rights, and corporate capture. Today, the fourth webinar will focus on the important area of trade justice. So what is, what is trade justice? You might be more familiar with the term fair trade. Uh, the concept applies to creating systems of production, distribution, and consumption that embody principles such as accountability, environmental sustainability, fair labor practices, gender, race, and cultural equity. In many cases, such ethical practices are certified by a third-party organization, are voluntary, and are used by businesses as a way to market their product and brand. In some cases, the certification and label do not match the actual practices. 
Purchasing products that are produced and sold in an ethical way has gained popularity in the last decades, with younger generations supporting these standards more than older ones. So I read, uh, I read in doing research for this uh, webinar, in 2015, a survey was done, and 86% of millennials said they seek out ethically sourced products. Um, it, it's notable, we'll, we'll cover a bit of how trade justice, trade justice often comes into direct conflict with the system of free trade that has been the dominant structuring force of international commerce. And it's supported by um, organizations such as the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund, as well as trade treaties such as NAFTA. Uh, naturally, naturally, our existing illegal and unregulated market for psychoactive drugs has few formal rules for trade free, fair, or otherwise. In creating a new system of legally regulating drugs, a more ethical and just system, is it possible to create standards and tools that meet our hopes and expectations? We're delighted to have an expert panel of speakers at today's webinar. Collectively, they will address our current trade system, introduce the principles of fair trade, and examine how drug markets could incorporate fairer practices and identify barriers we need to overcome to reach that goal. Because the entire supply chain is a bit large to address in one webinar, we'll be focusing on the perspective of the cultivation of drugs. I hope you find this topic as interesting as I do. So without uh, further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker who is Nick Dearden. And Nick is the director of Global Justice Now and author of a book, Trade Secrets, The Truth About the U.S. Trade Deal and How We Can Stop It. He's been a campaigner against glo corporate globalization and for global economic justice for over 20 years. And he regularly contributes to political analysis, re regularly contributes political analysis to publications including The Guardian, Al Jazeera, Open Democracy, Red Pepper, and Soundings Journals. Nick, take it away. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. Um, and thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, I have to say I am not an expert on uh, trade in drugs, um, but um, I know a little bit about trade. So I'm going to really, this has been a great opportunity for me to have a think about how some of this stuff might work. And I'm going to throw out some ideas and, and problems, I guess. Um, and, and, and I'm absolutely fascinated to see what, what answers we might come up with together um, today. So let me first of all say I fully support this campaign. I think it's great what, what, what Health Property Action and all the other groups on here um, have been doing um, in terms of pushing this issue, um, which so many have been scared of for so long. And I'm so impressed that you're thinking it through in, in, in the level of detail that you are in, in these seminars. And I guess that's really necessary because when it comes to selling drugs on the international market, you confront global trade rules. And global trade rules, as currently constituted, do uh, nothing um, to promote a more just world. In fact, they encapsulate all that's wrong with the global economy. Um, workers and small producers receive a tiny fraction of the value of the products that they create, um, forced as they are to live by the rules of a very rigged marketplace. While on the other side of the equation, big transnational corporations are protected and privileged um, in the role that they play, very often extracting value from the same workers, farmers, the environment, future generations. Let me lay out three specific ways that I think trade rules could be seriously bad news for the producers of, um, of legalized um, drug crops. So first of all, um, trade rules today have tended to promote agribusiness, industrial scale farming, and transnational control of, um, of land and, um, and what's done on the land. Um, on the one hand, they prevent governments being able to protect their farmers and food crops. So it's extremely difficult nowadays, especially for developing world governments, rich world governments get around it, but for developing world governments to offer subsidies, price controls, help with marketing uh, inputs into, into food products and so on. Some countries like India do it, but uh, it's not easy for them and it's a constant battle. Um, and, and countries with less weight in the global south and India um, will find it absolutely impossible. It's on the one hand. On the other hand, transnational capital and big finance are highly protected by modern 
um, trade rules. So governments uh, are told regularly to strip away laws which discriminate against foreign capital, discriminate against foreign capital, um, making it easier for corporations to come in, buy up land um, with no necessity to put anything back into the local economy. That's all con that all constitutes uh, unfair and discriminatory behavior as far as modern trade rules are concerned. Um, the epitome of, of this system is a, is a parallel legal system which foreign capital can use to sue governments and bind the hands of governments whenever they do anything that said corporations don't like. It's known as investor state dispute settlement. Um, and of course, once uh, 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 transnationals have come into a country, if producers start fighting for their rights, it's very, very easy under modern trade rules for those corporations to up sticks and move. And this is just a huge problem because if, if drugs were legalized tomorrow, um, the, 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 the ability of corporations to come and buy up land grow drugs absolutely everywhere, thereby forcing down the international market price of those drugs is, is very high and they would have protection in doing that. So you look at what happened to coffee, um, previously, you know, a, a, a reasonably um, priced uh, commodity, um, no longer because absolutely everybody in the world was told to grow this crop um, to the point where you know, the, the, the transnational corporations can control its price, control where the value sits, um, i.e. You know, to, 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 towards their own interests and their own benefits with, with producers getting very, very little. That's one thing. The second thing that I started to think about, and I haven't thought about this much, is the whole patent system. That actually, when it comes to modern trade rules, what we we have a free market, as I've already said, for those at the bottom. For those at the top, we have a system of kind of monopoly capitalism, essentially. Um, a lot of protection. And, and, and what we've seen happening in, in recent years, especially since the TRIPS agreement, the intellectual property agreement came into international um, uh, trade law in the mid 90s, is transnational corporations uh, taking crops, making small changes to them, enhancing them, genetically modifying them and patenting them. Um, and, you know, by the way, spreading their GM crops to other fields and then accusing farmers of theft and so on. So suddenly farmers don't control what they produce anymore. Big TNCs can rake in the profits based on their intellectual property, which they can hold in tax havens or, or whatnot and escape um, the taxes that they should be paying to developed world governments. So this turns something which should be good for the South. I mean, we often, you know, sure trade can be good for the South and traditionally has been, but one of the ways it's been good for the South is it's allowed producers in Southern countries to learn from the know-how and technology that's, that's, that, 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 that's occurred elsewhere. So they don't need to reinvent the wheel and take that and use it. Again, it's almost impossible for, for, for developing countries to do that today. China does it, sure, but unless you have the power of China, um, it's, it's really extremely difficult for you. Third and final way um, that, I, that I thought of when coming up with these notes is, is, is uh, in a way, a, more politi a, a bigger question of political economy. And that's that I think the trade, or, or at least the drive towards an export-led um, economy, uh, can distort developing economies in often unhelpful ways. And this is something quite fundamental. I, everyone knows that exports can be beneficial for de developing countries, sure. It earns revenue, often hard currency, i.e. Western currencies, um, that, that, that they can use um, to, to, to better effect um, than their own currencies often. And, and many NGOs, including my own, my own, used to spend a lot of time discussing the need to secure open markets um, for, for in the North for products coming from the global South. And I don't want to say there's nothing important in there um, for us to learn from. But I think you also have to admit that a country is never going to grow rich off exporting basic commodities, food commodities particularly. And, and, and I fear for the reasons already given that drugs are going to fall into that category. They're going to, they're going to fall into the, 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 the food category. They would fall in value, TNC takeover, as we've, already, as, as we've already heard about. And frankly, unless you can do something to increase the value of that product within your country by manufacturing it into something more, something more like a kind of end product, you risk um, making an economy just dependent enough that you give over your best land um, for it, land that you should probably be growing food for your own people on. And so you gear up your economy to the export of this crop, but you don't, you never really gain enough from it to properly develop your economy. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, even if you do manage to manufacture this good in some way, you know, there are real problems with access to markets as soon as you start manufacturing goods for, for most southern countries. That's where global trade rules are a problem again. 
So those are the three ways I've thought of. Now, with radical changes to these trade rules, of course, we could begin to turn this situation around, and my organization exists to try and do that. But um, let's, let's not pretend this is an easy task. I mean, this stuff is hardwired into the global economy. So to my mind, absolutely, we need to move away from the idea of endless trade liberalization for its own sake and think about how we could have a managed international economy with rules around securing um, uh, development, full employment, the green revolution, all those other things that we need that, that put trade liberalization well down the list of, of kind of priorities. And, uh, you know, I, included in that could be rethinking how we value commodities. That was certainly something that Southern countries were interested in the 70s around the new international economic order and so on. So it's, it's worth thinking about all of that stuff. But it's a long way off. And I think when it comes to the very specific case with, we're discussing here, we might want to build in protections from the very beginning. So fair trade is something we've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of buying fair trade cocoa or fair trade cannabis or whatever. But we've got to bear in mind that fair Fair trade was developed in a world where, where and because commodity prices were in freefall because of global trade rules. So for most products, it hasn't really changed that. It's given a better income to those on the margin for some people, but it hasn't fundamentally changed the way the global economy works in terms of food products. And I think what we're talking about here is different as well, because what we're talking about here is, is currently illegal. I mean, there isn't a legal um, trade in, in, in these kind of products. I, I just started thinking maybe we can use that to our advantage when we start thinking about this. When I started thinking about this, I thought, actually, maybe we, we, we want to just keep this, these, these products out of international trade rules altogether. But of course, I do recognize that part of what we want here is a legal, nonviolent way for farmers to be able to earn money, for governments to be able to accrue taxes. And making trade impossible in these products you know, wouldn't actually end do, do anything to end the illegal trade in drugs, therefore. So, you know, two other very quick thoughts. First of all, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's true that as a new product, we would have certain advantages. I mean, there are no international tariff lines on these products at the moment. Could you actually envisage a system where you put very high tariffs? Um, not to disincentivize trade, but because we know people would pay potentially these prices for drugs and it would be quite a good income earner for governments. But would that really help dampen the illegal trade? I don't know. Um, and I, that just got me thinking to my final point, really, which is I wonder whether the best approach to this is that we want to make it legal for some people to grow, sell and buy these crops, but not for others. Uh, so some countries, for example, I believe this is the case in Portugal, people on the call will be able to tell me better and will understand it better, have said you can grow this stuff if you're part of a kind of collective. Uh, but you can't just grow it as a TNC, growing it for export or whatever. Could you have an international component to that kind of growing collective so that, you know, in a country you can have farms or collections of farms producing this stuff, potentially manufacturing it, and then you can have collectives of individual buyers somewhere else in the world. I mean, a bit like, you know, you buy really fancy coffee today, maybe off, off an individual producer or group of producers who can guarantee it's you know, maybe something like that. So those are just my thoughts. Um, they are in, in no way answers, um, but hopefully some provocation for the discussion that's going to follow. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nick. That's that's really fascinating. I think so many so many questions uh, came, came up in my mind. Uh, with that, but I think you really highlighted how um, the, the structural issues of, of drugs uh, as an illegal illegal uh, economy now uh, both both makes them different, but they also fall into these this framework uh, that that sort of involves all, all sorts of, of uh, you know production of agriculture and things in, in the global south. Like I think I think there's there's a bit of there's a bit of you know just structural issues around capitalism and free market that that are are going to shape how we create this but um it was really fascinating just some of uh your, your end point about how we can think of uh, different ways or or individual ways to treat this new and um th th this new market that's uh th that's coming out because we, we have a liberty with with uh, moving to a completely new um a, a new product and new um, a structure to, to create different rules that maybe go outside the norm. So thank you for that. Um, and so I, I'd like to move on and introduce our second speaker, um, who is Pauline Tiffin. And Pauline is, is the editor in chief of the Journal of Fair Trade. She's worked actively to make trade fair for more than 30 years. She's done that as a worker, a company director, an innovator, an advisor, a consultant, a mentor, and a writer. 
Among other accomplishments, uh, Pauline consults with Verite and serves an advisory role in Uganda as chairperson of the Ruenzori Sustainable Trade Center and as a supervisory board member of our partner, the Transnational Institute located in Amsterdam. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. So I wanted to try and chip in. Um, a bit like Nick was saying, I'm not an expert either, but I know quite a lot about small farmers and have uh, figured out some of the levers over the years that can shift behavior and set norms. And that's really what I wanted to pull out and sort of focus in a little bit on the rules, the regulations, the kind of visions that make sense and the practices that deliver those visions for this emerging market. And, and to take that opportunity that, that I think we have an important moment, if you like, to set the curve or to set expectations and requirements. And so everything that I want to comment on in a few slides I put together is from those experiences of doing this. Um, Tess, can I go to the next one? So I wanted to remind people <laughs> and myself, which is what's really good at this point is although there are a lot of choices and dilemmas, you know, Nick, you did a good job at some of those dilemmas are very testing. Actually, depending on what is a good idea, you don't have to reinvent everything in this debate. You know, this is not virgin territory here, right? And that a lot of people have been working very hard for a long time on trade justice issues, have been active, have been successful. And when it comes to the issue of fair trade or trade that is fair or fairer, we're looking at a 50 year plus social movement that turned into a political and economic movement and brought together producers, social entrepreneurs, uh, nonprofits, consumers, all who came and worked out and painstakingly uh, achieved and worked for trade, which did certain things that conventional trade doesn't even aspire to do, right? So, the, the point of a just trading system for many people who have worked in it is that it should deliberately set about to do more than just trade goods. You know, it should include people, it should explicitly and deliberately favor targeted social or ethnic or other groupings, women and men, youth, who are organized, who become organized, become more than the sum of their parts, become less atomized, have a voice, um, and organize in a variety of ways, depending on the setting. Um, all though, and tens and tens and tens of thousands of these now exist all over the world of all sorts of sizes, um, of all sorts of political motivation uh, with, with um, a willingness to target, particular farmers, particular producers, and to go that extra mile, make up for the problems in a supply chain or the problems in a setting um, with extra investment, with pre-finance, with a bit of care for what's really going on or an interest in what's going on. For training when there are barriers, particularly for marginal producers, I feel that these are the kinds of things that if we're talking about an emergingly visible um, cannabis set of supply chains, including in, in developed countries, it's our opportunity to say, well, they should all be decent. They should all be best practice by now. Why, why start with a low bar and spend 200 fucking years trying to clean it up, right? So we should be starting with a high bar and I'll come back to that. And that the thing about fair traders at their best is they've always engaged in producing, trading, promoting, marketing with an eye on change, not just on a great product or a great cup of coffee or a beautiful basket, but 
always about redressing injustices. The very word in fair, in fair as in fair trade, implies there's something wrong and you've got to fix it. And you have some belief that if you work in a certain way, you can improve social conditions, you can address environmental problems or prevent them occurring, and you can secure and deliver better livelihoods for people who just are not going to get them any other way. And so I think those have been the, the meat and, 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 and vegetables of the fair trade movement. And I think one of the most important things of this movement and very important for the emerging cannabis market actors is that it, it gave rise to demands for better practice from others. Just the very element of choice that you could choose this one or that one exerted pressure and made other conventional traders change, right? So I, I'm moving to the, the idea that we want that mimicry. We want that copying of the best by those who will then not go into this market deeper for fear of reputational damage or being shunned. Let's move on. And I think the biggest important lesson, I think that the, this coalition and this grouping of, of concerned actors can replicate is that all those types of efforts ended up with not about legal requirements, but a really important normative framework. And however much key companies tried, and they're still trying, they can have not been completely able to to dodge, the biggest transnational corporations have not been able to completely dodge the discourse on fairness, on sustainability, on social impact. I mean, they do pervert it and they don't have it in their ethos, but they haven't been able to duck it. So I think what's trade justice in practice, what's a really good thing to target here? What are we really looking for is important to establish because if you're not holding up the flag and saying, this is what we want, this is the best of the best here, then people will invent it for themselves. So I, I started this conversation with the advocates for the cannabis as an emerging market area by saying, you have to have a manifesto. You have to say what you want. So I think the best of the fair trade movement has shown that you can really ally your trading work, your investment, your relationships to the SDGs. And I think lots of companies say they do, they tick boxes, but they don't have it in their activities. They don't have a really good clarity of purpose. And you'll find all sorts of problems which companies and producers are trying to solve based on the environment, based on the situation. But by implication, those people who are going into more purposeful trading, more just trading, are trying to redress an injustice. And I think it's really, really important for, for this because we may be in a, in, a, in a new market, but we've got a lot of history and harm to clear up. There are a lot of wrongs to be righted from a long period of uh, criminality, criminalization. So I do think the, the goal of being very targeted, very transparent and very uh, specific, I put up here and I put in the links, um, the World Fair Trade Organization, which just has truly a very nice statement of what good really looks like, really does. And it's, and it's very crystallized from the perspective of the, of the SDGs in ways that generally companies don't seem to be able to. I think we should accept that we're going to end up with a very eclectic bunch of players and not look for uniformity and why not? We have it in the fair trade movement and actually in the journal that I edit we've got we've one out and we've got one coming where I, we have lots of essays on the most crazy wacky stuff from you know the importance of a global symbol like tartan to identity and belonging and beauty Futu, we have an article on cannabis and we've called all of these atypical fair trade and we're still receiving a lot of, a lot of proposals for, for new ideas of, of how to make trade fairer. 
So I do think we've got a movement here that's emerging that is going to be quite authentic and quite backy, um, very heartfelt, not all about profit. And we need to start setting that framework that this isn't just a new super biotech thing that you can make millions from, but there's a whole history of consumption of narcotics in culture, in society, in in economics. And I think that's important that we somehow incorporate the, the history as well as the vision. I want to really, really then talk for the last few seconds and minutes of my thoughts that I'm sharing on vision. I think we need to balance that idea that there are lots of things that are going to force actors in this new market to behave reasonably well, right? There is the law in lots of countries, the codes of practice, there's lots of ILO and UN conventions. And, you know, increasingly that's like quite invasive and quite, um, quite proactive, even in, I shouldn't say it quite like this, even in the US. So you can have uh, consignment stopped at port um, under various bills by customs, US customs, if there is a doubt or a suspicion that they were produced by child labor or forced labor. So there's a lot of interventionist stuff inserting into the legal frameworks for international trade. There are some increasingly large numbers of countries that have various types of anti-modern day slavery, anti-forced labor, anti-trafficking legislation, reporting requirements, and also now companies being obliged to comply and to report on climate change and carbon emission targets and, and set targets and report against those targets, not only in their home, their home states, but um, their whole supply chain. So we, it's not all gloom or doom. I mean, they're not all super effective, we could critique them, but I did want to set them there. I think there are plenty of, you know, level playing fields um, and non-tariff and tariff, not tariff barrier debates that could be kind of taken in to protect indigenous producers against people who come and grab the land and, you know, supersede them in, in need, certain uh, territories. Pauline, I need, to, I need to give you a time warning, uh, please. Okay. <laughs> I think it's important that we also look at what works, which is investor opinion and concerns. There's an enormous history and an important precedence for us to do with investment and ethical investors. So let me go to my last message. So I wanted to say that it's time to hoist the flag. It's really important to create a demand, a pressure, a requirement for traceability. And you can push for traceability, you can require traceability, but you have to build accountability. If companies in entering and op operating in this market, don't feel the pressure to answer for how they trade, how much they pay, prove that they're doing a good job with audit, even want to be a good, a best, a better cannabis company, then you will not get the kind of qualitative, purposeful results. So you need to create that environment of benchmarks, checking, calling out. And there's so many models for this, I couldn't even begin to start to list them, although I did send some links over. So we need to develop the, the, the benchmarks, the best, and we need to drive um, consumer and investor loyalty for those who can be bothered to even try. That's my bit. Thank you very much. I, I, th I think it was great. You really highlighted um, a, a lot of the, the structural mechanisms we can use to ensure that um, that, that trade actually is just, and it's not, you know, I think there's there's a bit of a tension when um, people see that marketing themselves as as fair trade or or with with a uh, you know certain certification leads to more widgets sold, 
um, that, then there's there's an incentive to sort of do that at the lowest cost. And, and our, our task is to ensure that that behind behind the the message and the and the posturing is also actual um, mechanisms of things like a traceability and accountability within there. So thank you for um, outlining that in such a such a great way. So, so next I'd like to um, introduce our partners in Myanmar and we're gonna see a video. And uh, also these, these two folks are, are in our audience watching uh, this webinar now. So I say, welcome to you. And um, th this, it's actually a series of two videos uh, back to back. And so we have uh, Zhao Tet Yong, uh, coordinator at Lands in Our Hands. Uh, and Angelo, who is a chairperson of Pecon uh, Farmers Network. Um, and so uh, we, without further ado, will go to the video, which I think you will enjoy. Hello, everyone. I'm Zotet uh, from Land in Our Hands, which is a, a multi-ethnic multi nation platform for land rights movements in Myanmar. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share what is the trade and agricultural environment in Myanmar. Um, as a natural resource rich country, we are good at uh, extractive industries and also uh, exporting raw materials. But at the same time, we are um, weak in, in, in social justice, uh, fair trade, and uh, uh, equality and equity. So uh, mostly agricultural produce uh, has to rely on border trade, which is world time, um, unstable and risky, especially for peasants and small farmers. Um, uh, uh, how about the policies and the sports around the, the agricultural supply chain and value chain? Uh, actually, mostly uh, policies and, and, and supports, uh, they, they are only for the loans and real financing. So it, at the sports here I mean is uh, technical sports and cash and in-kind sports and other related sports. Um, so in here I, I like to give a real example of how the Department of Agriculture supports for the um, to, to prevent post harvest loss. Um, so, it, so every year uh, around this time, uh, it's it's a harvest harvest season for paddies, uh, and also we used to have um, an, an an expected rain. So, the Department of Agriculture put an announcement in uh, in the newsletter with 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 a nine square inch. Uh, box uh, saying that dear farmers, uh, there will be uh, rain possibly in your harvest time. So please reap faster, trash faster, pack faster, and clean up uh, the whole uh, field. Um, so that's all. That's all the support uh, the farmers get from Department of Agriculture for for post harvest loss prevention. So um, and and also many studies uh, says that. Most of the profits uh, are going to millers and process, uh, pr processes uh, rather than going to farmers. In actual, farmers are taking more risks. So it's like the risks of uh, getting loan burden, getting into um, debt cycle, and, 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 and chemical impacts of chemicals on their bodies and also on their, on their, on their land and on their swine. Uh, and also even losing, you know, they are losing control of their seeds, um, their crops, um, and, 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 and even on their land. And um, so it's like most of the um, um, generations, from, young generations from farmers, they are abandoning their farm uh, and seeking uh, the jobs uh, at, at the urban cities. And also it's like um, the young, people who are abandoning their farms or otherwise they have they, they left uh, they, they leave uh, their homes because of armed conflicts uh, or maybe many various reasons they are accumulating in larger cities especially in Yangon so which is um, um, making resulting uh, a cheap labor market especially in Yangon or and especially in government sector so, which is also known as, which, which, which we already noticed that there are lots of human rights, labor rights violations in these sectors and also huge involvement of um, military back businesses in, in this sector. But uh, the thing is, uh, there are like um, 
some improvements, uh, some efforts uh, we can see to improve the labor rights situation such as due, human rights due diligence in the supply chain uh, of the government, tech, government, government and textile sector. But for the agricultural sector and for the, for the peasants and farmers, it's, it's really invisible. And also the trade policies uh, and, and also the, the, the uh, internal policies and, and, and regulations and laws, they, they, uh, they are not really favorable for the uh, peasants and small farmers. Instead, they are uh, wiping out and, and pushing away. Um, so it's like um, the, the, the farmers, both from the plainland and also the hilly region, they have no choice. Uh, either they, um, they, they have to take more risks and and yeah, I'd like to conclude that uh, the trade and policy environment um, and, um, in, in, in Myanmar is still not favorable for peasants, small farmers, uh, and it's, it's a bit far away to say about the fair trade, social justice, uh, equality and equity. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Mero, Angelo Lukovare, Shampine Tongpain, Pekong Myoma, Nivare. เลชิมาโรเปโกตองตูเรตมะคุงเยสุเรปีเคเอฟเอ็มสุเรเปโกฟาร์มอนเนวอร์มาจอเอนเนนิบาเรเซเทมาเบเอ็มโอเอฟเ
uh, from some of the tensions that people experience on the ground, uh, gr growing, um, growing uh, both, both legal and illegal crops and sort of what, how, how our, our pricing system, uh, largely in inflated value due to prohibition, have uh, favored the, the growing of uh, illegal crops uh, and, and lack of price supports around food, food crops, uh, you know, encourage people, encourage people to um, do the thing that makes sense to them and their current economic situation. That's um, really, really fascinating. So thank you, thank you for that intervention. And so now I'd like to go to our last speaker who is uh, Tom Blickman. And Tom is a senior project officer at the Transnational Institute, TNI, based in Amsterdam. Since 1997, he's been working for TNI's Drugs and Democracy Program. He specializes in international drug control policy and the UN conventions, drug markets, alternative development, money laundering, and organized crime. Tom, welcome. Thank you, Scott, uh, and thank you for the organizers to have in, um, invited me. Um, this is a, a complicated uh, issue. We, uh, um, in the drug policy world, have been looking at illegal markets, and now we suddenly are also confronted with the fact that things we advocate for, uh, uh, having a legal market for, uh, drug bearing plants and, 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 uh, and drugs um, has, uh, of course, a lot of uh, uh, new challenges. Uh, <clears throat> what's up the, the screen right now is a um, uh, quote, quite a lengthy quote, I must say, from a, a report we um, um, published um, one and a half year ago. We, we, um, uh, presented at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in, in Vienna in March 2019. And uh, I'll put it, it's quite lengthy, but I still want to put it out there because it, it describes a little bit the, the current situation, uh, particularly around uh, cannabis. I will be mainly talking about cannabis, by the way, uh, because that is um, at the moment the most uh, it is the most chance to, to, to uh, evolve into a, a legal market. Coca and opium are, are still far away. And, uh, but I think a lot of the, the things we, we, we can learn from how things are now going with cannabis will uh, also apply to, um, to uh, opium and coca. So um, historical policy changes are now reshaping the global cannabis market and the gradual dismantling of the prohibitive regime that reigned in past decade, and that's a welcome development. It would be a dramatic outcome if the legally regulated medical and non-medical markets of cannabis that are arising from the ashes of prohibition ultimately lead to what prohibit, prohibition intended but never succeeded in achieving, the destruction of the remnants of traditional cannabis cultures that barely managed to survive, and the eradication of the illicit cannabis survival economies in the global south. The construction of the global cannabis prohibition regime was a historical mistake with severe consequences. But if the transition towards a legally regulated market results in a corporate takeover that concentrates profits into a handful of big pharma, agro, and cannabis companies and pushes small scale farmers in the global south out of business, another historical mistake is already in the making. This is Basically, the situation as it currently is, and it's not promising. Uh, policy changes over the past five years or so have dramatically reshaped the global cannabis market. Not only has there been uh, an unprecedented boom in medical markets, but following policy shifts in several countries, a growing number of countries are also uh, legally, uh, have re legally regulated or are preparing for legal regulation of non-medical use of cannabis. Uh, many for-profit companies from the global north are now aggressively competing to capture the illicit spaces and rapidly opening in the multi-billion dollar global cannabis market, both for medical as for recreational use. Uh, and this threatens 
to push small scale and marginalized traditional farmers from many countries in the global south, those who have to supply the illicit market for decades out of the emerging legal market. Uh, and as legally regulated cannabis markets start to grow, now is the time to secure a le legitimate place for small farmers using alternative development, human rights, and trade principles. The policy trend towards regulation, both in terms of medical cannabis and further down the line, more widespread recreational use, uh, potentially opens opportunities for small farmers to shift towards the rapidly expanding legal market. Moreover, it would only seem fair that those who have endured supply, su supplying the illicit market, those who were most affected by the war on drugs, and those who in many ways paved the way for the policy changes should be first in line to benefit from the emergence of illicit spaces in the market. Those trying to transition out of Ill illegality, however, face huge difficulties due to the combination of, of, of the legacy of criminalization and legal and administrative barriers to entry. Conquering and protecting spaces for small scale farmers in traditional producing uh, countries within the current overheated and highly competitive global cannabis market dynamics will require affirmative action and well designed leg legislative and market strategies. Uh, current obstacles to cross border trade in, in recreational cannabis uh, include the United Nations Drug Control Conventions that limit trade and export and import and export. The, the 1961 single convention, the, the cornerstone of, of, the of the building of conventions, only allows cannabis to be produced and, and used for medical and research purposes under certain conditions. Uh, the required controls include that the government agency designates the area where cannabis can be cultivated, licenses specific farmers or companies to grow it, and has the exclusive right of importing, exporting, wholesale trading, and maintaining stocks. Such a government monopoly, monopoly intended to counter the diversion of, of legally uh, produced cannabis for medical and, and scientific use, might actually now also be useful to keep the industry under control. Yeah, maybe we should also think about preserving some of the controls uh, in, in, in the uh, through control conventions provided that they are changed in, in a way that uh, uh, legal uh, cannabis can be legally regulated for, for uh, also for recreational use, uh, might maybe open an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to, to try to organize the market differently. Uh, but what we see now mainly is that countries that are now legally regulating cannabis for recreational purposes only allow closed domestic markets. And in, in an attempt to comply as much as possible with the other obligations of drug control conventions in order not to accommodate non-regulating countries, import and export of recreational cannabis are not included or rather explicitly excluded in domestic uh, regulations. Um, for example, we now have a, a four-year experiment that will start uh, probably next year in the Netherlands to supply the, the coffee shops with, regulated, with a regulated supply of cannabis. Can, cannabis. Uh, it also in, it excludes the import of, 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 uh, of cannabis. And that uh, will mainly uh, be, uh, that will mainly <clears throat> uh, will be a problem with uh, the hashish because hashish is still 20 to 25 percent of the market share, and, and much of it is coming mainly from Morocco. But the, the new uh, requirements for, for, for participating uh, in, in the four year experiment for, for uh, companies that want to uh, cultivate and produce cannabis that is, and that will be mainly for profit companies. Uh, one of the requirements is that the um, that they need to produce hashish, although there is no traditional uh, hashish production in the Netherlands. Um, th this is now a requirement to have uh, to to to, uh, to acquire a, a, an, um, a license for uh, supplying the coffee shop. So the likely future nationwide regulation model will this push out the foreign produced hashish out of the coffee shops. 
and exclude trad traditional growers in Morocco, Lebanon, Afghanistan uh, that have supplied this, this market for decades. Uh, the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana also noted uh, a serious concern that a new system could place economic power and benefit too much in the hands of large foreign business concerns to the detriment of several stakeholders, including small farmers. Uh, cannabis has fueled important economic gains and livelihoods for those small farmers and traders who now fear that liberalization and legalization might disempower them. And it might also be useful to remember that much of the current illicit cannabis market in the Caribbean was the result of the dismantling of the EU Caribbean Preferential Trade Agreement for Banana since like the late 1990s. Uh, it, it, a result of the neoliberal free trade ideology at the time, which is still very much uh, dominant. And many banana growers in Jamaica and, and in the Windward Islands, especially St. Vincent and the Grenadines and St. Lu and St. Lucia were forced to shift to cannabis for subsistence. And uh, local growers will tell you uh, that Ganja, as cannabis is called in that uh, region, has schooled children, built homes, and allowed the residents to survive the economic fallout from the once profitable banana industry. So there are well substantiated fears that the new green rush based on speculative capital are leading to land grabs and the squeezing out of small traditional growers. The rise of big cannabis finance of a big cannabis finance industrial complex is a real prospect with, with concerns that cannabis will go the way of big agriculture, big ag, in which a series of mergers and acquisitions have led to an extraordinary degree of concentration in the world, world food system. The current legal cannabis market is not a level playing field, as particular market actors have been able to take advantage of early legal options available to them, most notably in North America and Canada, where cannabis is uh, now legally regulated, as you know, but also in, uh, in the States, in the states in the United States that also have legally regulated uh, cannabis. Um, and you see strange things happening. But, but for instance, in Africa, uh, more and more countries are allowing medical and industrial cannabis for the export market, not for their own market, for the export market to the global north. And they are after the, 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 the revenues, the tax revenues. <clears throat> the latest example is, is Rwanda that now allows the production of medical cannabis for export to the growing uh, global market. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but the licenses in Rwanda go to corporations from Canada, Israel, the US, and the Netherlands. You see it happening. You see, even see it happening in, in, in developing uh, domestic markets. For instance, in South Africa, where the proposed private use cannabis bill effectively excludes traditional subsistence growers from Mpondoland that have been supplying the South African market for decades eh, through restricting the amount of plants that an individual or household can, can grow. Eh, one of the farmers already complained. It was better when, when Kanye was illegal. There's no way I can plant four or, 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 or even 12 plants. There is no family that can survive with four or 12 plants. In short, there's an urgent need to include trade uses and fair trade practices as an important part of new, new legally regulated drug markets. Uh, the drug policy move, reform movement should put the issue higher on the agenda, uh, as outlined also in the, the 20 principles for the responsible legal regulation of cannabis that was published by IDPC uh, recently, and work towards inclusive and equitable trade policies through a global supply chain that promotes uh, more equitable distribution of value along the supply chain uh, and, and in this way legally regulated markets can contribute to rather than undermine progress towards the sustainable development goals. Uh, can you put the slides back on this? I uh, will now go into some of the yeah proposals of ideas um, to, um, yeah, to try to address the, the issue. Uh, and one important thing, of course, is empowering the producers through inclusive business models. Uh, legal markets should, should seek to distribute power and value across the supply chain by enabling alternative business models that empower communities. Inclusive business models can span a range of different structures from joint ventures to farmer producer owned enterprises to fair trade initiatives, etc. 
Uh, and they stand in, in contrast to the, the general commodity market where pharma producers are simply seen as the providers of raw materials and automatically occupy the lowest end of the supply chain. Uh, and inclusive, inclusive business models fo should focus on how producers can become engaged in processes of value addition and have a greater democratic control and decision-making power and become an advocate for themselves. Uh, and Tom, I'm gonna, Tom, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to give you a two-minute warning, please. Yeah, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, the other thing is supporting producers through development assistance, training, and investment. And um, urgent issues are there securing land, access to land, uh, investing in infrastructure and public goods and services. Uh, and the third, providing technical assistance and training. Producers should be supported in capacity building and skill development programs. <laughs> In, for example, appropriate growing techniques, environmental conserv conservation, preserving unique local strains of cannabis, very important, marketing opportunities, and to successfully navigate uh, the cumbersome regulatory requirements of good manufacturing practices and good agricultural practices. Uh, related to that is that alternative development projects should assist growers from the global south. So in the past, alternative development was, was a kind of uh, uh, drug, crop substitution for drug bearing crops that were prohibited uh, and and now that we have to make yeah the case that future RDA projects should include projects with, with cannabis and be focused on how to achieve access for the additional growers from the global south for both the medical and developing recreational markets and this it could include preferential trade agreements for countries from the global south that have suffered most from the drug war and, uh, and the development. And then an essential element of, of, of empowering producers uh, by these three uh, things I've mentioned before is, is encouraging the formation of, of cannabis cooperatives and, and growers association, both in the North and the South, I would say, by pulling together resources, technology, knowledge. Uh, it is possible for producers to retain a degree of independence and have greater influence within the market. It can allow them to make joint purchases of land, buildings, equipment that would otherwise be too expensive for any single producer or to navigate the complex regulations and standards collectively. Uh, and I would say a coalition of, of small-scale craft producers in the north and growing communities in the south could find common ground here. Uh, the fourth thing is, and that is maybe more a little bit more controversial, uh, we should start thinking about how to rein in the current aggressive corporate cannabis industry market industry model. Uh, in the past, we, uh, um, well, it's a little bit controversial because we hoped that the cannabis industry would be an ally in uh, drug policy reform uh, and, and it could help um, uh, um, in, 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 uh, in the struggle for reform, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to believe that that was a uh, a nice dream, but it's not going to be uh, not going to happen. So uh, I think we should really look for for anti cartel, anti trust legis legislation against would be monopolies, uh, and, and and to provide an equal playing field for for uh, businesses from the global south, or farmer communities from the global south. Um, well, we should even, if if a company has a fifteen percent market share, it should be broken up. Uh, you can also say, well, alcohol and tobacco industry should not be allowed to invest in cannabis. And uh, uh, these are probably uh, a lot of legal barriers against these kind of policies from the World Trade Organization and, and, and in multiple free trade agreements. But if a complex global prohibition regime can be devised and sustained for several decades, a transition towards an abusive and equitable, an equitable drug policy in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goal, goals must be possible as well. Uh, psycho psychoactive substances like cannabis or opium or coca are not ordinary commodities like uh, avocados or tomatoes. They have been subject to different regular, regulatory regimes and there are good reasons to do so, uh, but we can maybe uh, uh, use uh, that element of, of, of drug crops to, to have a, a, yeah, a, a better control over, over, uh, over the market. And okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we have to, we're, we're sort of on time here. Okay. Uh,
Just okay? one, one, one last thing, um, very quickly. It's the last uh, uh, slide. Uh, address the current international framework of drug, UN drug control conventions, um, uh, because that is really hampering uh, international trade. And uh, yeah, we, we should look at, at ways to do that. And one of the options is the interstate modification agreement between several like-minded countries that would uh, allow um, a, a trade and, uh, and um, uh, the use of re recreational cannabis and, 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 and as such uh, help if countries from the global south are part of the say agreement would help uh, to open the possibility to have uh, free trade fair trade for um, cannabis growing communities in the south thanks thank you thank you very much tom uh, i i think that was a great you know you're, there was uh, a bit of overlap between last the last webinar around corporate capture. And I, I think it's it's great to, um, how you illustrated sort of the intersection between corporate dominance in the market and how, how that impedes our efforts to uh, achieve some of these goals of trade justice uh, by, by, by just squeezing out uh, traditional farmers uh, in, in the process because they don't have they don't have the capital, they don't have the expertise and the capacity. And so uh, thank you to all of our, uh, panelists for your interventions. We're going to move now a bit to the Q&A section of this webinar. And so we have uh, a bunch of questions that have uh, popped in. And I, I want to start uh, just basically around um, what, what are, can, can we point to some examples of other other industries or products or uh, supply chains where we, where we see uh, how that's worked, like how it's created democratic institutions in, in communities, how it's supported, um, you know, inclusive decision-making processes involving smaller farmers. Are, are there any, are there any good examples in, in other sectors that we can, that we can point to that, that this is, this is, you know, these are models that we, we want to emulate. And I guess maybe that might be directed at uh, Pauline uh, to start, uh, I think. Just the mute, the mute button. What's that? Mute, there we go. Can you hear Thank me you. now? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Um, Yes, there are. I mean, I think there are two levels, though. I think it's really important for cannabis farmers to, uh, I think, get quite a lot of assistance to adjust to a, a more open and more legally accepting reality. Because the first instinct is not to be transparent and to organize and to share and trust your neighbor if you've been the subject of harassment and reporting and oppression, you know, in, in all of your career as a, as a that fantastic uh, speaker uh, from the Opium Farmers Network. So I think, I think there are two levels to um, how organizing can build um, new forms of social uh, support, progressive, helpful, mutually uh, beneficial uh, social relations which have not existed before. And I would point to um, some of the Central African areas of Burundi, Rwanda, DRC, Western Uganda, which have just been, you know, just rampaged by war and mines and armies going this way and armies going that way. And, and trust is not an easy commodity to build in those situations. So I think if you look at the, the efforts in those countries in Rwanda to bring tea farmers together, tea, tea pickers, and to form cooperatives to create more social trust and collaboration is really one very distinct but really important form of organizing and voice and self-help towards social development, peace, and, and some better prospects, because immediately you're not on your own, you are better off, 
because then you have a little bit more negotiating power, a little bit more voice. But I think that's a very dis a distinct reality and a distinct set of challenges. I think as movements, I think smallholder coffee farmers have done well, particularly in regions in Latin America, where many organizations have come together and they formed more meta organizations. You know, either at a national level, Mexico for many, many years has had collaborations of all sorts of coffee farmers all over the country. And believe me, they had a lot to fight for, the right to export on their own right, the right to get credits, the right not to be subjected to the political permanent revolutionary party that was, that was for so many years. And, and, and they really built a very strong base, which had its foot in, in, in what, has, what became leading fine coffee, niche coffee, market um, demanded coffees through to political platforms. And so I think those two things are separate and I can't, it's hard to see in very isolated, very marginalized and very dislocated and harmed communities from criminalization that you would quickly, you would quickly have that mess. Mess. Ooh, the meta organizer. Meta but that you get there, you'd get there. Did that answer your question, Scott? Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And so the next the next question, I think um, I'll direct to Nick to start. Um, but uh, to what extent would uh, legal legal cannabis um, sector in developing countries like just automatically fall under under existing free trade rules? Like you talked you talked a bit about like carving out uh, exceptions in different ways. But what what part of this is sort of out of the control? Um, and it just automatically would fall under those existing rules. I wonder if you could dig a bit deeper into uh, what you think is going to happen or, or you've seen happening in, in some of these places uh, where it's already legalized. It's a really good question. I mean, as far as I know, and I, and I may be wrong here, um, it, it, it isn't, it, it, this doesn't fall under international trade rules anywhere at, at, at the current, none of these products do. Um, it, Except perhaps, and maybe people know this uh, on the call, um, obviously there is some trade in these products for medical use. So it's highly controlled. Um, but of course, you know, the opium that we use in hospitals in Britain is not grown in Britain. So there, in that sense, there is a, you know, there is a very small, very, very restricted um, trade in it. What you can learn from that trade, I really don't know because I don't know how it works. Um, it, it's also, yes, it is true that, that when some, when I guess a new product like that comes onto the market, um, the rules that govern it are pretty unclear because they kind of need to be negotiated um, either at the WTO or between different countries and, they, and, and none of this stuff will be liberalized to begin with. So yes, that gives us some potential to really think about how we can use this product as a way of almost trying to create a better system um, from the bottom up. I suppose the thing that worries me about it, and it's kind of come up quite a bit um, in, in Tom's presentation and, and what other people have, have already referred to, is there's already a whole group of, of, of businesses who are kind of getting ready for this trade to fall under international trade rules. And so it's, we're going to have to create a hell of a, a, hell of a, a movement and a moment um, to prevent that simply happening um, in, in exactly the way that Tom described in his presentation. Actually, I mean, to, 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 to conceive of the legalization being something that makes life worse for small farmers rather than better. I think, it, I think it's really gonna be a, an incredibly big fight. And, and it's honestly something before this seminar um, I, I hadn't really thought about before. Um, so I do, I noticed one of the other questions was about the manifesto that Pauline put together. Yes, I mean, I think those kind of ideas, this is exactly the right time to be doing this, it sounds like putting together those ideas that rather than simply integrating this product into uh, under normal international trade rules, um, we try and we try and integrate into the international economy in a different way. So let me let me just follow up a little bit. So one of the things that Tom uh, brought up in in his uh, presentation was was this idea of a, an inter se treaty modification. And so this has been something, it's, it's sort of a rarely used mechanism, but it's been something uh, that, that's been discussed around a way to get around 
uh, or, or modify the, dr the drug treaties that prohibit trade in um, uh, non-medical use of, of substances. And so the idea would be that uh, uh, two or more countries would ent enter into a particular like bilateral or multilateral exception to the drug treaties. So my question is like, is, is this a mechanism where those parties could establish trade rules that would supersede uh, some of the free trade or other treaty obligations? Like if they're creating their own sort of mini market economy through uh, this agreement, are they, are they able to establish things that would promote uh, fair trade in, in those, do you think? Potentially, yeah. I don't see any reason why not, apart from is the political will there to do it? Um, you know, I mean, you can yeah, you can do stuff, you can kind of do what you want, but, uh, um, and, and we should absolutely, you know, the thing that I think is really important, the thing that's really struck me from this conversation is, is we actually need to look at exactly how that would work and, 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 and potentially begin now putting pressure on for such a solution because it, it will be an incredible, it will be a really big uphill battle. But yes, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Oh, no, man, if, if, I, if I may, uh, I try to point that out that yeah, cannabis or coca or opium are not ordinary commodities. They're psychoactive substances that can do damage and do damage to certain people. So there is always a opportunity there to um, set certain controls. And if you look at, at the 1961 convention, uh, yeah, the trade in medical and, and scientific uh, psychoactive substances uh, is, uh, uh, should be a government monopoly. Yeah? And uh, yeah, if you have an interstate modification, you could uh, maintain some of these uh, strict control mechanisms to prevent uh, for profit corporations to uh, take over the market and uh, set uh, and also because it's UN, you can also maybe try to include uh, the sustainable development goals there and have a, a, a try to, to, to build a, a, a different kind of uh, market and a different kind of economy. And yeah, but I want to, uh, yeah, the fact that these are psychoactive substances gives some leverage on trying to do something in a different way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I don't know if this is directed to anybody in particular, maybe whoever wants to can comment on it. But, you know, largely a theme of this webinar series is, is about engaging uh, the development sector. And so we have a question of how, how can we more effectively engage in general uh, non-governmental organizations and government voices in the, the fair trade discussion and movement uh, in, in this field, in this particular area of drugs? Like how do, how do, we, how do we create the, the discussion that would lead to better policies and, and decisions around that to, to bring more actors into this? Yeah, well, th th that's a complicated one. One of the of the obstacles there again is there, there's the there, there's the convention as an obstacle, you know, as an as an opportunity. Uh, yeah, um, that, that is an illegal product, uh, so that makes it difficult to other than um, crop substitution to have uh, development policies. Uh, so, but yeah, that's but one of the things we are not thinking. Uh, about within TNI is is yeah looking at how we can how alternative development can be used to help cannabis farmers where where, where there is the, 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 but maybe of also for opium and coca where there is a, a, a legal market to assist them to access that legal market you have to understand these people are mostly living in in a very uh, uh, far away uh, parts of, of the country which bad uh, uh, infrastructure, and, and, and often also in a conflict situation. So yeah, there is, there's a lot that is needed to help these people to, to access those markets. And uh, yeah, alternative development could be a way, uh, instead of eradicating crops, of helping farmers to access the emerging uh, legal markets. Um, just, just Scott, I want to see if I can also just try and answer, uh, from my perspective anyway, 
your question about how do we get more people involved and i think i think that what we learned in the fair trade movement was consumers need information and it's such a cliche now right but i think this is so true um, of this emerging market so they need to know what's at stake now what the opportunities are what the harms have been the issues with the products we need to demystify the 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 crazy uh, impressions that people have of both people who might grow cannabis people who smoke it people who want to use it even medically it's not a there, there isn't a broader deeper social acceptance of this so i think there's a real case to be made um, for that for for educating consumers and to giving them a chance to see there's a new story here and i also think it would be good if there was some kind of way of showing the development and this is where these these webinars have been so important i think that this is a development issue because some of these community communities have been brutalized punished forced to produce forced not to produce <laughs> shot at and isolated and are you know tempted by the reality of the income against the cruelty and brutality of a state or a, cr a criminal justice system that doesn't let them do it so lots of hypocrisy leaving leading double lives in order to feed and and send their kids to school so you think there's a really really important developmental challenge there for income and livelihoods and somebody asked about the un i i didn't know the answer i would love to know whether whether the, they've moved beyond forced diversification and other weird things that they tried to do in the past. So I just wanted to not lose that question because I thought it was important. Yeah, I, I think I think something something we often experience in the drug policy world is is, you know, drug, as you mentioned, you know, drug use and drug uh, production and distribution are highly stigmatized, but even conversations around drug policy are, are stigmatized and, and often often governments are you know it's the the, the third electric rail that that they don't want to touch or don't want to highlight as as an issue and, and that really stands in the way of having discussions that lead to reforms and so um we, we we have another question that specifically relates to like is is there a connection between the uh, fair trade policies and practices that directly relate to sort of reducing the criminalization and incarceration of of people who are growing um is there you know how, how do these how do these trade guidelines and policies, including things like international frameworks, can they be used to challenge sort of this idea that that behaviors need to be criminalized or punished? Is that Nick? Do you do you have something on that? Is that? No, I think sorry, Pauline was yeah. something. Oh, she was muted. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Pauline. Uh, yeah. No, I saw that question. And, and I found myself thinking, you know, really out there, quite crazy thoughts, <laughs> but I didn't write them down. And, and what I was thinking is that, you know, it, it's like to prove that something shouldn't be criminalized, sometimes you've got to prove there's nothing wrong with it. Right. right? You know, and some of you will have heard me in one of the other panels, and I just think we're thirsty and need documented you know the good example the what it can deliver right you know the the what has to be changed what can be delivered if you can do that change and you need sort of courageous producers courageous companies and some courageous su supporters consumers to make the case and to win the argument and to show that it's not it's not awful it can it doesn't have to be that way and it shouldn't be that way you know and um you know there's a whole generation my generation that got a bit traumatized by all those movies of people you know being criminalized incarcerated and all the other things i think we've got some we've got some undoing of that narrative and i think 
fair trade's efforts to tell quite complex stories, not the fair trade certification story, which is a bit formulaic, but, but social enterprises, even B corporations in the US, really sometimes really dedicate themselves to solving certain problems. And I think we should find companies that are willing to try and do that and to break through. And, and they'll got lots of resistance, but they might get lots of support um, in the market from investors, from crowdfunding investment, all sorts, I think, for people who are ready to crack open the story. But that, that might raise, a, sorry, yeah, that, that might raise another issue as well. I mean, by the way, I, I mean, I think the, the discussion here is, is, is very poor at the moment. We had a, we had a slight, slightly more liberal conversation here in the late 90s and, and early 2000s um, around drug legalization. There was a huge pushback and, and now this is, you know, it, it's very hard um, to discuss this here. Though interestingly, I mean, I'm fascinated by the experience of some of the states in the US and the impact that that could have here. I, that, that I think is, you know, really interesting. The other thing yeah. that hasn't really come up and I just wanted to throw in very quickly is the idea of an industrial strategy around this stuff. I mean, back to the idea of, you know, uh, yeah, okay, this may be good, good for some of the farmers and that's really important, but in, in terms of a country's development strategy, how useful is this? Um, I think that all depends upon what government framework is put around this in some of the countries concerned, you know, whether it be Bolivia, Colombia or some of the, and, and I don't know whether any work's been done on that, but I certainly think it's worth thinking about, you know, what are, what are the other products that may be produced with this stuff that would actually allow a government to add significant value to stuff that it was exporting around the world and to gain a real competitive edge in some of that stuff. And, and that, that for me would take it to the next level beyond just this is a, a kind of food type commodity that you're exporting. Great, thank, thank you very much. And on that, on that sort of uh, optimistic comments, I think we uh, unfortunately are out of time now. Um, I, I would love to continue this uh, conversation much, much longer. Uh, there's definitely more to talk about, but thank you uh, all for coming. Thank you to our brilliant panelists. We really uh, enjoyed this conversation. I really appreciate uh, all of your expertise and input on this. Um, and uh, so we have some more webinars coming uh, on the slide. You can see the next one is November 4th on tax justice. Um, you, um, it's it's gonna be at, uh, all, all of ours are at the same time uh, in two weeks. Um, and so could we tax the drug trade to create funds for public services? That's the question at hand, let's find out. So please spread the word to colleagues, networks, join us for the rest of the conversation. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we will see you all in two weeks. Take care. Goodbye. Have a great day.